Listen, there's a reason the ultra wealthy have been investing in fine wine for centuries. Historically stable returns and a lack of volatility make it stand out compared to traditional assets, especially during a downturn. But now you can invest alongside with them with Vint. Vint is an SEC qualified investment platform that offers shares of the most sought after wines in the world. So join the thousands of investors diversifying with fine wine and spirits. Learn more at VINT.co. For full investment disclosure information and more, visit VIN. Hello and welcome to All Indians Matter. I'm Ashraf Engineer. The Indian news media find themselves in the midst of a severe credibility crisis. India, a complicated country that faces convoluted social, political and economic challenges, needs an effective washdown. Instead, what we've had over the past eight years is naked bias, toxicity in news presentation, utterly fake reporting, in short, media that simply refuse to do their job of asking questions of and speaking truth to power. This has also lowered the quality of public discourse and it's getting worse by the day. Many like me have simply stopped consuming traditional media and moved on to more credible sources. Sometimes I wonder if the media's growth itself has been its enemy because it has coincided with, and this is ironic, a shrinking of the space for dissent and the proliferation of Hindu supremacist hyper-corporate values. Is there a way out of this mess? What can the Indian news media do to restore their credibility? Are they even interested? All Indians matter. We have on the show Vasundara Sirnet, a political scientist and journalist. She was formerly the chief coordinator of research at the Hindu Center for Politics and Public Policy India and a non-resident fellow with the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C. She's also the creator of the India Violence Archive, a citizen's data initiative aimed at recording collective public violence in India. Welcome, Vasundra. Hi, Ashraf. It's really nice to be on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me on there. You're very welcome. Vasundra, have you gathered the courage to watch an Indian news channel in recent times? Oh my goodness. I'll answer this honestly, no. All I do is watch little clips on uh, Twitter that are shared and those clips are so problematic and it makes me very frightened about what's going on in India with respect to the media. But yes, on occasion, I do sort of tune in to a few channels just to see what's going on. But I have to say, I value my mental health a lot. And so I'm not exactly (laughs) going to be turning on the news channels all the time, you know, because they are very disturbing. The content is extremely disturbing. A good choice. I keep them all completely off. I don't even kind of tune in even once in a while. But yeah, I I can't avoid the clips on Twitter, like you say. But in the bias, Vasundra, is shocking and unapologetic, isn't it? Uh, Take the coverage of the farmers' protests or the CA, NRC and agitation. Also, the Bharat Jodo Yatra massive success is virtually blanked out. Yes, that's actually something I did raise on social media, on Twitter, actually, where I said that I would like to see just the coverage of Bharat Jodo Yatra. But it seems to be the case that it's not happening. What you have instead are editorialized news shows where they're talking about whether it's going to be a success, whether it's going to be a failure, what is the opposition trying to do, where does Rahul Gandhi fit into all of this. But the question is that as the media, as journalists, the responsibility of every news channel or newspaper should be to expose the Indian public to what the opposition is doing. You don't have to agree with the opposition, but you actually still have to give them the airtime. You still have to give them space to articulate. And that's the role of the media. And it seems to be the case that they're not doing that very well. And therefore, you see that the Congress has got its own Bharat Jodo Yatra Twitter account, and it's completely bypassing the media and connecting directly with the people, because I think at some level they've understood that they're not going to get the airtime, they're not going to get favorable airplay. And the most they can do is send some of their their spokespersons on these news channels to sort of counter that propaganda. But at that point, it becomes a circus, right? Where is journalistic reporting on this? I do think some print portals are reporting quite well on the Bharat Joro Yatra, so I'm happy to see that. But if you think about it, the channels that reach every single home in India, for instance, like Republic TV, my understanding is that they do not cover it in the most favorable light. Yeah, that's absolutely right. It's almost as if a large section of the media has become a spokesperson of the BJP. 
Well, that's actually quite true. And interestingly, that's not a new phenomenon. The way the Indian media evolved in India, it was very clear right from the outset. For instance, if you look at the formation of ANI, which is a premier news service and wire service that actually seeds a lot of reports. And if you notice, ANI gets a lot of the government uh, comments, government sources, breaking news about what various ministries are doing, where the prime minister is, etc. They're the ones who get it first. And then based on those reports, you have all the other channels and portals that follow through. But if you look at how ANI was set up, there's a very, very interesting article by Praveen Donti in The Caravan, which is titled How ANI Reports the Government's Version of Events. And it was set up when the Congress was in power. It was set up with the cooperation of Indian government agencies and, of course, the press. And you realize that they've been doing that for a very long time. That there's a difference now, and the difference is that we are in a space where the media cannot continue to do that. You need to cross-examine your politicians. You need to interview them and ask them hard questions, and we don't see that happening. So there is a pro-state bias in the Indian media. It's been there for a while, but at this point, it's not just pro-state. They're not just saying, okay, we're pro-state, and this is what we're reflecting. This is the government's version of events, and here is what we are going to tell you. What they're also saying is, riding on the back of that is also, well, you have to hate X or Y community. And I'm not saying that ANI specifically is doing that. I'm just saying that that's in the ether. When you don't ask politicians that engage in hate speech, for instance, hard questions, when you don't cross-examine them on their views, what you're inadvertently doing is encouraging that phenomenon. And as I always say, what you permit, you promote. Yeah, absolutely. And I find it quite uh, ironic, Vasundra, that uh, we are in a time where fact-checking organizations have become necessary. Yes, indeed. And, well, I've actually given some thought to this because recently there was a controversy over whether the Mohammed Zubair, Pratik Sinha and team who run Alt News, which has, I think, provided a phenomenal service in these times in terms of fact-checking. I've had some time to think about what that means. And I think that we can no longer ignore the fact that the way the contemporary world across the world, you know, the way you see propaganda being trotted out, whether it's America, whether it's the United Kingdom, whether there is it's Brazil, for instance, or China, fact checkers have become extremely important because there is an understanding that traditional journalists are across the world pro-state. They are not being adversarial. They are not cross-examining their subjects, which are the politicians. They are not holding truth to power. And therefore, in that landscape, what you realize is that people who are fact-checkers across the world, they're doing an immeasurable service to democracy and to citizens because they're actually telling you, hey, look, here's an alternative way to look at this. And this might actually be the truth. And we've done the fact-checking and here's what we found. So you believe what you have to, but these are the facts. So fact-checking is, it's not just something that two people are doing in India. It's something that's emerging across the world. And one thing that I've realized is that it's extremely important because one of the promises that you make in a democracy as a politician to citizens is that you're accountable to them and that you're telling them the truth. Now, if you have no standard of what that truth is, how do you as a citizen make a decision about what's happening and who you should vote for? And truth is important when you make that connection with voting, right? Because a citizen needs to know what they're getting into. And that's why fact checkers are important, because they can actually call out a lie. So I do support their efforts completely. Yeah, completely correct. And I think uh, Zubair and Pratik have both paid a certain price for it. As you know, Zubair was in jail for a, a while before the court set him free on bail. I think, Vasundra, one of the problems is that news gathering is very expensive. So it's better to get five people together and have them shout at each other, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that does seem to be the case. In fact, there's a little clip that was shared of four people in a car and they were all shouting at each other. I think it was released a couple of years ago, if I'm not mistaken. And they were all, a couple of them were from different parties and they had started the little broadcast while they were in the car going to the news station. And I thought that was pretty funny. 
But at a macro level, it's not that funny. Because what you're doing is you're not giving news. What you're doing is you're performing a show. And the news is not for entertainment. It's for information. But we've reached this space where it's infotainment. And yes, news gathering is expensive. But I also think channels can afford it. They're not exactly cash strapped. You know, maybe some organizations that are poorly run might be. But a lot of channels in India are extremely wealthy and they can afford to send journalists. I mean, they've sent a journalist after Deepika Padukone's car. If you remember the famous clip, you know, of somebody chasing an actress's car and, and screaming into the mic, oh, that's Deepika's car, et cetera, et cetera. What was interesting about that particular incident is I was thinking, okay, there's a camera crew. There's obviously a patrol being spent in this car or diesel or whatever. There's a journalist who's being paid for their time. And they're doing a chase sequence. And I remember looking at some of the leaked chats from a particular journalist in India. And one thing you realize is, oh, they're actually encouraging these chase sequences because it, it heightens the drama. It keeps viewers hooked. The debates, quote unquote, I don't think they're debates. There's something else. It's a performance. What's happening in those debates is when you as a viewer are listening to those heightened voices, when you're listening to those grandstanding that takes place in these shows, you're getting some sort of a dopamine rush and you're not asking questions because when someone's screaming at you that this is the truth, that's epic levels of national gaslighting. You know, you're being abused in a way. You're in a cult, you're being abused and you don't even know that that's happening because someone is screaming at you that this is how things are. And this is a terrorist attack when it isn't. Or this person is somebody who should be in jail when that person hasn't done anything wrong. So you believe that and then you echo it within your family. You echo it on the streets. You echo it at the workplace because you truly believe it. And I think that's extremely dangerous. Absolutely. And as, as you said, you echo it in your family, you echo it in the streets, you echo it in the workplace. That's the sort of virality by itself, isn't it? And uh, I think I completely agree with you when you say that you know, people are just screaming at each other. What I believe is that because of that, the issues that need to be spoken about aren't actually covered very well. I mean, some of the issues that have been very poorly approached over the past few years are minority rights, Dalit issues, equality, justice, fundamental rights. I mean, take the Rohit Vemula suicide, for instance. Instead of analyzing the causes, so many media houses questioned whether he was a Dalit in the first place. So what's your view on that? Oh, absolutely. In fact, one of the things that I've seen emerging recently is the fact that people on the margins of Indian society, whether they're Dalits or Muslims, even women, they have started forming their own YouTube channels. They have started reporting on themselves because nobody else is. And the Rohit Pamula case and many others like that, you know, that was the first time we heard the term institutional murder when the young man committed suicide. And that's a case actually that I talk about when I explain caste to anybody that I'm speaking to or in a lecture. And I talk about how it's still alive, discrimination is still alive, and how this young man died by suicide. And the discussion was around what his caste was and not what had actually happened, that this was a result of institutional discrimination. So there's a way in which when you engage in the journalism of what aboutery, or when you focus on one part of a larger story, like in this case, Rohit Vemula's caste, what you're doing is you're invisibilizing the larger system, the larger process, the larger cluster of institutions that create that result. A young man should not have died by suicide. He should not have been in that situation to begin with. It breaks my heart. And it did break a lot of people's heart. We can understand, we can identify. I still think empathy is alive. And the question should have been, how do we prevent something like this from happening in the future? What can we do to make uh, situations for Dalit students much better, much more supportive in higher educational institutions? And those are the questions that were not asked by the mainstream press, but they focused on his caste. Instead of asking why a young man who was obviously so very brilliant, so very meritorious, had taken this terrible, terrible step to end his life. And that is extremely heartbreaking. But what has emerged on the back of that is reporting from marginalized communities. There's the Mook Nayak, there is Maktoub Media, 
uh, there's Khabar Leheria. There's a wonderful documentary on Khabar Leheria, the cluster of Dalit women who are reporting on their villages. And I think that's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant because the Indian media has ignored them. It has relegated things that happen to them as events. I, this is something I always say to students when I talk to them, that, you know, for instance, if you're covering poverty, don't treat it as an incident. That's what we do. Treat it as a process. Poverty is a process. This is something systemic. It's something institutional. So don't just stop reporting on it when somebody dies in a terrible way. That's almost as respectful. Report on the process, what created that result. That's the job of journalism. Absolutely. And that's something that happened to a very small extent, actually, with the Rohit Vemula suicide. But uh, Vasundra, from what about to read to both sides, I am referring to the journalist's refusal to tell it like it is. Instead, the media simply report both sides' views and thinks the job is done. What's your view on that? So I can't remember who said this, but there's a difference between being a journalist and a publicist. And that difference comes when you ask questions and you're skeptical of what you're being told. In India, we've lost this element of skepticism. So we tend to take what is being told to us at face value and we believe it. And that's what the news channels do when they're screaming at you 24-7. I was in the camp that a few years ago, before I reorganized my views on this particular issue. Since I'm also a political scientist, so there's a conflict in the training. The journalist in me wants to be skeptical about everything. The political scientist in me wants to stay neutral because that's what we do. Because we're trained in research in a particular way. You look for data, you look for facts, quite close to what journalists do. But the way you look for data and facts in political science is far more rigorous because you will not get your PhD, you will not get your paper published if you get something wrong or if you cooked up something, right? It's, it's just, you just can't do it. It's an honor system. However, post-2014, something shifted even for me when I realized that it's not enough to ask questions. You have to almost be adversarial with the people you're talking to because when an entire nation is being encouraged to hate X community, Y community, Z community, whatever it is, right? When an entire nation is being encouraged to hate a constructed other, an outgroup, you can't have both sides. Because at one point, you have to make a decision about where you stand as an individual, where you stand as a human being, and what you think is right or wrong. So at some point, it becomes a personal decision that I'm not going to support this. And yes, a journalist should report on hate speech, for instance, but they also need to call it out. And that's where the adversarial nature of what we do comes in, which also, I think, by default for some of us makes us dissenters. Yeah. And how much do you blame Indian consumers who are not willing to pay much for consuming media? I mean, this makes the media dependent on corporate and especially government advertising. Sure. A lot of print newspapers and publications, for instance, do depend a lot on government ads that are run in them because the government in India does run a lot of ads and you can actually kill a publication if you stop running ads in them. The problem is that with the digital world, things have changed. So if I want news, I don't necessarily need to have a subscription to something like the caravan. I do, but I don't need to have it because I can find the same news somewhere else. I don't need to have a subscription to the Hindu or the Times of India because I can find all that stuff on Twitter. I can find it online. And, you know, even historically, I think print publications, which is where journalism started and radio, for instance, which were basically state run broadcasts back in the day. Prices used to be limited, but now it's extremely difficult for a middle class family to actually afford those subscriptions. So I wouldn't put consumers in the dock. But I do think that at some level, those subscription-based models need to come back. Because it is only when you pay for something that is of quality that you get what you're looking for. But if you've got news channels who've got a lot of money, who are spending all this money trotting out you know, publicity, propaganda, whatever you want to call it, and you're getting it for free. Why would you go and spend money on a subscription to some magazine or to a newspaper? You know, it affects your household bills. A lot of people aren't wealthy. 
And even if you look at the poorer strata of society, they actually cannot afford. A lot of them can't even read. So where are they getting their news? They're getting it from channels. They're getting it from radio. They're getting it from YouTube. And YouTube is free unless you want to have a premium membership or something. So how do we resolve this? I do think it's important to bring back the subscription-based models of journalism. But I also think that in a place like India, where you have, I think, the maximum number of 24-hour news channels in the world, which actually just run on ads and you know investment from very rich people, it's going to be extremely difficult to do that because who's going to pay? Sure. I mean, uh, I agree with most of what you said, but I mean, you know, also the thought comes to mind that when it comes to consumers who can afford it, I mean, you know, monthly subscription of a newspaper, for example, would be less than 100 rupees or close to 100 rupees or something like that. And you get a lot more back in terms of benefits through gifts and things like that. But you wouldn't think twice about going and spending two or three thousand rupees for a meal, which uh, is just instant gratification. And, you know, it's just a few hours. Obviously, your need to be informed, your need to be able to understand what is happening in the world around you is a lot more important, but you're not willing to spend that money on that. So, I mean, how do you react to that? Well, I think you're right. I, there is this disconnect. I mean, people, there are people in India who can afford newspapers, but then look at what they're subscribing to. A lot of them aren't buying the Hindu. They're buying Times of India and mostly for Delhi Times, the supplement. <laughs> which tells them, you know, where the sales are and where the yeah. movie, <laughs> movies are playing and so on. And, and that's okay. That's a choice they're making, right? In my experience, the people who actually have multiple subscriptions to newspapers are people who are preparing for the UPSC exams, you know, because they need to be on top of, of what's being said and what's going on and so on. But I think you're right. I think that uh, this may be actually a conscious choice that people are making, that they don't have a problem spending a lot of money on a meal or going to the salon and getting their hair done, right? But when it comes to a newspaper, well, maybe we don't need this. And if they're getting a newspaper, it's something that's actually not the best quality product that's out there on the market. But at least they're reading something. So maybe, I haven't thought about this, but maybe this is something that we need to look at. How much of this newspaper reading or magazine reading business is linked to the general culture of reading? And how it may be dying that the way we now consume information is through video. We listen more than we read. Yeah. So I, I don't know. What yeah, you... listen or watch more than we read. I completely agree with that. Like that has coincided with the digital age, of course. Uh, but uh, I mean, again, just coming back to the responsibility of the consumer, and because I think a lot about this, if the consumer doesn't want you to be a hate spewing machine, if the consumer doesn't want you to only have debates instead of news, then there is a certain pressure built on you as a media house. I'm not sure, sure that's happening, that pressure is happening. What do you think? Well, this is a very, very tough territory, right? Because one thing we've noticed, which I think was it very recently when Arvind Kejriwal from the Ahmadmi Party said that there should be the faces, the pictures of goddesses on notes, for instance. And a lot of us were wondering, why did he say that? And then you realize that there's probably been some sort of a poll that's run. There's been some sort of market survey. And you realize that this kind of talk sells, right, in the public sphere. So the question that I had in my mind is, what sort of public do we have now? What sort of voting public do we have now that actually buys these messages unquestioningly? And it can actually lead to, as the AAP believe, a difference in the voting outcome in the future. And that goes back to what you're saying, which is that, you know, how do you put pressure on news channels to give information instead of opinion? And my question is, do they really want information or are they quite happy with the opinion? I don't know. Yeah. So that's exactly, I mean, where I'm coming from. You know, there's a lot of responsibility that rise on the consumer too. Incidentally, just, uh, just a word on the Kejriwal incident that you mentioned it's in the run-up to the Gujarat elections which are around the corner I think. so I think you're absolutely right it's about the voting public more than anything else but this is a good time to talk about media ownership which is transforming hugely in India Reliance owns much of the landscape now Adani is getting into it with the NDTV acquisition how does that affect reportage and why should the average person care well it does affect re reportage Unless you're 
somebody like the Washington Post, which is owned by Jeff Bezos, one of the richest men on the planet, and you still kind of hold on to your editorial freedom. In India, I don't think it's that simple because the culture is that a lot of very wealthy people now want to get into media because it pays. It's a very lucrative business. There are times when I don't think of certain people in the media as journalists, but as corporate news workers. And we should be concerned about it. We should be concerned about it because if the information you, you're getting in the form of news is tied to anybody in power, you can be reasonably certain that you're getting someone's version of the truth and not the truth, quote unquote. You know, you're getting something that's truthy and in many cases, not even truthy. But if you look at South Indian news channels, a lot of them are owned by wealthy people who are also into politics. If you look at the people that back Republic TV, for instance, you know, again, one politician in particular. If you look at a lot of other uh, smaller newspapers, you find wealthy people with political connections with their fingers in a lot of pies. And what does this do to the news landscape? It's scary. Honestly, as a journalist, you know, as, who's worked with a very good Indian organization, which is a, a family run business up until now, it's difficult. So either you need to have a really strong editor who says, I don't care who owns this, this portal, this channel, this newspaper, I'm going to do what I need to do. And I'm going to do what is pure journalism. And this is what I'm going to report on. Or you have to you know, get the kind of coverage you get on something like Sudarshan TV. My God. <laughs> which is completely biased, completely communal. Sudarshan TV reminds me that uh, when Dara Singh, who was the perpetrator of the crime against uh, Australian missionary Graham Staines and his two sons, you know, they were the ones who batted for the release of this convicted person. And one wonders why that's not the job of the journalist. You know, you don't, unless you are convinced that someone is innocent. So this was a person who was tried and convicted. And a lot of the Sudarshan TV handles on Twitter were saying, well, release Tara Singh and so on. And you have to wonder why, right? That's just one of the things they did. They've yeah. also done a lot yeah. more. Do you think the decline of our media mirrors the decline of our democracy? It does. It does. But the... The causes of both are different. I think in terms of the media, there's journalism and then there's the free press. And I think in India, those are two different things. So the causes for the decline of the media are, of course, you know, corporate ownership, agenda setting by powerful people, the fact that there is a lack of understanding of what journalistic ethics mean. We've seen that very recently in some of the things that have played out with the VIO, for instance. And of course, they understand what journalistic ethics mean. I think in this case, we don't really know what happened there. You know, they were hoodwinked by someone is, is the story that's there. But then where were the checks and balances? I think those are the questions that need to be asked. Where was that strong editorial oversight? Where was the cross-examination of their own story? Was that done? We still don't know. So I think I'll wait and see where that's going. So you have that on the one hand. But on the other hand, you also have the decline of democracy. The term that's being used is backsliding. Democratic backsliding is the term that a lot of political scientists are using. And it's not just in India. It's, it's in a lot of places. When Trump was in power, America was said to be democratically backsliding. When Bolsonaro was in power, Brazil was said to be democratically backsliding. When Erdogan was in power in Turkey, Again, Turkey was said to be democratically backsliding. And that's a cause of concern. The reasons for both are different. I think the reasons for the media are related to the media sphere and how there's corporation control now or company control over a lot of these outlets. But in terms of democracy, what is causing it? Why is there all this backsliding? Well, if you think about it, it's a lot of it has to do with economics. There is massive inequality in a lot of countries. You have the, the resurgence of right-wing movements in a lot of countries that typically tend to be nativist, free market friendly at the same time. And there's a very different perception of what an individual is. You're not a rights bearing individual. You're the member of some sort of a group first, of a community identity first. 
And so the question becomes, who has rights in these democracies? Does the group have a right or does the individual have a right? Which is a chicken and an egg problem, even in democracies like India. And once you have movements like this and they're acting, they're amped up, they're acting on steroids as in they're so powerful, they have so much reach and they're not playing to your logic, they're playing to your sentiments and you're voting essentially against your own interests in a lot of cases. Well, I think that a lot of people may not think that, and that's okay. They may think, well, you know, this is our interest, and how dare you define it? And I completely understand that they're well within their rights to, to say that. But that's how you get into these situations of democratic backsliding. It's difficult, but I think a lot of it is driven by the shape of politics, a lot of it is driven by what's going on economically and inequality. I think we underplay the role of inequality in creating these situations, in creating anxieties that then need to be articulated at a political level. And that's where you get the rise of what is broadly called a right-wing movement or a far-right movement. And you get your vigilantes and you get your extremist groups coming out of the fringe and turning into the mainstream. Yeah. It's happening yeah. in Italy. How does the outside world, uh, the media, governments, the general public, uh, view what is happening with the Indian media? Well, I think it's a mixed bag. It depends on who you're talking to. So if you talk to, say, some correspondents from here who work for right-leaning portals, they would not have much to say. I think there's also an information problem in terms of how people read the Indian landscape because it's very complicated. But then if you look at the Committee to Protect Journalists, if you look at what the UN human rights people tweet occasionally in support of Indian journalists, you know, there is a better understanding that there is a lack of freedom of press in India. I, I forget what the rank is, but India ranks pretty poorly on the freedom of press rankings. And I think it is broadly understood that journalism is a dangerous profession in India, that uh, especially for women journalists, I'm, I must add, because you're not just being threatened for being a journalist. You're also facing a lot of misogynistic abuse for being a woman. So people understand that. I, I think they do. And I don't think it creates a very good perception of India in the rest of the world. Because a lot of the time, your journalists are the ones who are speaking for the country overseas. You know, those are the reports that get picked up by the New York Times or Washington Post and all these other big portals or The Guardian. And a lot of media organizations outside have desks that report on South Asia, for instance, and they've got their own people on the ground. And when you create a hostile environment for journalists within the country, then how well is it going to reflect on your democracy outside? Yeah. And just to come back to what you said about India's ranking in the World Press Freedom Index, I think it was, as of this year, 150 out of 180. This is a ranking drawn up by Reporters Without Borders. So it's that low. Yeah. And uh, speaking of media organizations, or I should say media bodies, organizations like the Press Council and the Editors Guild are toothless. Uh, while they may make the right noises sometimes, it doesn't really amount to any change on the ground, does it? Yeah, that's actually the Press Council is, is a very, very interesting body. I mean, I've looked at their membership, the most current membership. And I think there's one person from the Northeast. But where is your Just one. Region? Just one. Where is your diversity? Where is your representation of marginalized groups? There are so many journalists in India. I mean, just take a look at those names and you will, you will wonder. There are 28 people on the press council committee right now. And yes, they are supposed to make norms. They, they have a publication which is basically the, the code of journalistic ethics that's there. And quite interestingly, some of the norms are, well, you shall not report a fact which is untrue sort of thing. And then you wonder, well, <laughs> well, press council, couldn't you set up like some research committee that does nothing but look at all the news channel and po point out all the fake news? You know, why does alt news have to do it? I mean, the press council should actually be doing it, right? But it doesn't happen. And they can only censure and warn. But there is no threshold that says if you get 20 stories wrong, well, you know, you're a, you have to pay a fine. Or if you get 50 stories wrong on purpose a lot of the time, then maybe we want to cancel your license. They don't have that kind of authority. Yeah, absolutely. They cannot cancel licenses at all. No, they can't. They can issue warnings. They can censure. They can say, oh, this is really wrong. They can make all the right polite noises. 
But a lot of the time, they're not even doing that. The Editor's Guild is far more interesting as far as I'm concerned, because it's technically, it's independent in a way, and it's got some very, very good and interesting people on board. And they do weigh in from time to time. They do. And historically, if you look at, uh, I don't know how much you know about how journalism started in India and the, you know, one of the first publications was something called Hickey's uh, Bengal Gazette. He was, he was an Irish man who'd moved to India and he'd started something called the Hickey's Bengal Gazette, which was a small broadsheet sort of thing. And he spent a lot of time in that publication lampooning Warren Hastings' wife and reporting on British society and so on. It's very interesting. And Warren Hastings couldn't stand him and had him put in jail for a good three or four years, after which the man never recovered and he, he ultimately passed away. But that's how journalism started in India. It was the scathing criticism of power. And no one's saying that James Augustus Hickey did the best thing on the planet. Right. Yes, he was just lampooning the governor general. He was lampooning Warren Hastings' wife. He was reporting on all this other stuff. And a lot of it was a very sort of self-serving enterprise almost because he was also competing with other people who were in the publishing industry and he'd managed to buy a printing press. So, and as you can say, he had his name attached to the title of this particular broadsheet. But, you know, you still think back and you think, wow, you know, he had the courage to literally be scathing about whoever was in power. Where did that courage go? And how many journalists in India can tell you what Hickey's Bengal Gazette was like? I don't... In fact, I believe that, uh, you know, the Indian journalists were far more courageous even when we were being governed by the British. In fact, there was a lot of Indian publications uh, that spoke out very loudly and strongly against the Raj and in favor of the freedom struggle. Absolutely. Today, India is is free, right? We don't have a foreign power ruling over us, but yet somehow the media seems to have less of a spine uh, than during those times. Yeah, and if you think about it, I mean, the British had to come up with a vernacular press act to basically gag the Indian press and, and the Amrita Bazaar, and particularly the Amrita Bazaar Patrika, which was started by two brothers, the Ghosh brothers. And uh, what you realize very quickly is that, you know, they were really smart because the Vernacular Press Act applied to Indian language newspapers. So they started publishing in English. <laughs> so that's how the Amrita Bazar Patrika came to be in English. It's very interesting. And I think there are archives and records of the Patrika which are being digitized. And they found a few. And it's fascinating to go over them. There's so much courage in those pages. And the persons, the brothers who owned it, Shishir Ghosh and I forget his brother's name, but the Ghosh brothers, they're also identified as freedom fighters. Motilal Ghosh. Yeah, Motilal Ghosh. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I forgot the second brother's name. We always hear of Shishir Ghosh more. Right. So what can now the viewer or the reader do in such a situation? Is there anything they can do to effect a change? Yes, certainly. The first thing is be skeptical of everything you're being told through a news channel, even a newspaper, be skeptical. That's a mistake I made recently when I wasn't skeptical enough of the, the wires reporting on the meta thing. You know, I should have paid a little more attention. And I'm happy to admit that because it's a learning lesson because we, you realize at some point you all fall into this confirmation bias thing. You look for stories which already confirm your point of view. They confirm, you know, where you stand, what your politics are. And I think that's what's happening in India. It's this gray zone, right? This gray journalism zone where the same sort of organization is also appealing to the liberals and it's got some other platform that's appealing to the right wing and then something that's appealing to the lefties. You have organizations that are trying to play to every audience and you realize very quickly that it's there's they're basically product differentiating and playing to confirmation bias of all sides. So what you can do in this situation is be skeptical. Be extremely skeptical of what you're being told and ask yourself, you know, is this the whole truth? Try to spot loopholes in stories. I won't take any particular names of stories recently, but there have been a few where you wonder hmm, what's going on. And don't consume your news from social media. Don't do that. Read it, sure, because it's under our eyes, it's under our noses. But still go back and, and try to see, find more information, find multiple reports. I think a case in point was the Pulwama attack that happened in 2019. And I, along with uh, another friend, 
had written something on the reporting of how the incident was reported. And after going over God knows how many articles, I think we looked at 200 of them or so. And you realize the facts were different in a lot of them, right down to the car that was used in the suicide bombing, to the amount of explosives that were used, to who was the alleged mastermind of the attack. You realize that person had either been arrested or killed a while ago. So how was he still alive? But these are the questions that were not asked. And I think that's the level of skepticism with which we now need to tread in these waters. So that's one thing you can do is be a skeptic. Until and unless something is proven beyond reasonable doubt, don't buy it. I think that's healthy. And as I've recently learned, I should apply that to myself as well. The second thing you can do is try and support independent journalism. If you can, subscribe to something that you like. You know, subscribe to people that are actually making that effort. Support the efforts of freelancers because some we have some excellent freelance journalists in India. And unfortunately, they're paid so poorly that they have to take their stories outside to portals that will actually support their efforts. But why can't we do that here? Why can't we do that within India? Why can't we support these wonderful freelance journalists and actually give them the kind of money that they need to keep doing their work? Right. I do think the money exists. And I think with some help from consumers, you know, support them, subscribe to their Patreons. You know, at the end of the day, yes, it sounds like I'm asking everybody to part with their money to support journalism. But at the end of the day, information is what makes countries function. And if your information is distorted, the way you're thinking about you, yourself, your society, your economy, all of that is distorted. So if you value truth, then you're going to have to. I guess, in this world, pay for it. Absolutely. So, Vasundara, tell us about your work. I'm particularly interested in the India Violence Archive. So, okay. So, a few years ago, I had this crazy idea, which was brought on by the fact that I thought something was lacking in the political science literature about violence in India. There is a preponderance of studies that focus on Hindu-Muslim violence specifically in India. But they ignore caste riots, they ignore riots that happen for other reasons. And I felt that the literature was getting a little bit dated. And at a personal level, I was extremely disturbed by what I was seeing in India. I was seeing lynchings, which, you know, when I was growing up, the only lynching that hit the headlines in a big way was the 2000, I think, five Chajar lynchings, where A few Dalit persons were killed for trying to skin the carcass of an already dead cow. They were moving it from the road and it became a a very big incident. So when I saw the spate of lynching starting and then the debate started, is there rising intolerance in India? And as a political scientist, I started saying, well, how do you make that determination if you don't have the data? And that's where this project started. So I said, okay, if nobody's collecting information on crowd violence or collective public violence, let me see if I can. And then slowly uh, I tried to build it up. It turned into what I call the India Violence Archive. So it's basically a repository of information. There's Excel sheets, uh, which basically log in incidents of collective public violence, which includes riots, caste attacks, religious murders that are conducted. There's a lot of that political party violence, which is one of my favorite categories, which is to see how there's actually open violence between two different political parties. And it came to be very useful during the 2019 elections when I actually released some data. There were 128 incidents, if I remember correctly, during the polling period in the 2019 elections. And there shouldn't have been that many, but there were scrapes between workers of different parties. And you realize that the parties, which are the vehicles of democracy in a multi-party system, they can get into it with each other, you know, physically. And you just wonder what's going on. But it's very revealing to me to to do all the state of work. So there's a, a couple of people who help me with this project, and that's what we do. And uh, can the public at large access it? If yes, how? Well, not in its current form because, you know, we're, we're kind of lagging behind the rate of violence, honestly, in India, you know. We set up Google Alerts. It's a very simple thing to do. Everybody can do it. So I've got Google Alerts for Sampradayak Dange and I've got Google Alerts for lynching. 
And I've also got Google alerts for gang rapes because at some point I was trying to track them in real time. And there are, uh, we look over every day's newspaper trying to find, you know, where a police person was attacked or where there was a custodial death. There's uh, various, I think, 25 to 30 categories of violence that we're looking at. And it's a massive, massive project being conducted by a couple of people because we feel we have the time and we want to focus our energy on this because it tells us a lot about how the landscape of communalism and communal violence in India is shifting. And back in the day, you still have riots, actually, but you back in the day, it was mostly just communal riots, right? And you could identify it. This was an animal. It's called a communal riot. These are the certain sections that are going to be used. But then you look at lynchings and they're a completely different kettle of fish. And a lot of the time, it's deniable. You don't know who's involved. You don't know how to identify the mob. And it's not just claiming people from the margins. Now, you know, there are children being beaten up on suspicion of theft. You know, why is that happening? So at some point, I'm hoping that people will be able to access a lot of this information. But my only condition is that it be accessed sensitively and it be accessed with respect in the sense that we'd like to create a body of sensitive work around it where people can read and understand. It's not, it affects everyone and it claims victims from every community, but disproportionately more from one community than others. So those are some of the things that we are working on. And maybe we can even have a podcast around this. That might be interesting. <laughs> that would be really interesting. And I'm going to take you up on that, Vasundra. And I'm serious about this, so I will take you up on it. But this brings me to the question I ask all my guests at the end of the show. Why do you do this work? Gosh, oh my goodness. Okay, there are two levels to answer that. One is how my mind is oriented. I'm a very detail-oriented person. I like puzzles. And when I don't understand anything, I need to get at the bottom of it. You know, give me a ball of rolled up tangled wool and I will disentangle it for you for hours. I will sit and do that because for me, it's a puzzle, you know. I, I need we to know how to get you out it. of the way now. <laughs> just give yeah, me a ball of wool. Just give me a ball of you know, <laughs> tangled wool or something. That's It's just how my mind is. But at a deeper level, I've asked myself this question. Why do I do this? And I think it's what you should do. I think it's what everybody should do. When you see something, when you see a situation developing, which is scapegoating an entire community, at a moral level, you know that it's, that it's wrong. Everybody knows it. And what kind of a human being or a citizen would I be if I didn't try to shed more light on it? What kind of a journalist would I be if I call myself a journalist, right? If I didn't put my money where my mouth is and attempt to at least get at the truth. And it's frightening. My data collection scares me because there's so many incidents in there. And I didn't know the landscape looked like that. And so maybe this is how I pay my debt to my country, which is, you know, you raised me, you made me what I am. You gave me the education that was there. You taught me six different languages. That's India for me, right? And you gave me a stable environment in which I could go to school. I could access higher education, a girl from nowhere, you know, try to win scholarships to go outside to study. And maybe this is how I pay my debt to my country is by keeping the flame of some sort of truth alive. So so that's my answer to that. Vasundara, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and talking about the crisis of credibility around our media, which is in my view at least, one of the most critical national issues of our time. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, this was actually a lot of fun. I was wondering what it would be like to be on a podcast. I think this is the first one where I'm being interviewed. I have interviewed other people uh, for podcasting. But this was, this was very interesting and very cool. And thank you so much. And I, I can't wait to see when this comes out and uh, your other episodes as well. Thank you all for listening. Please visit allindiansmatter.in. That's A-L-L-I-N-D-I-A-N-S-M-A-T-T-E-R.in for more columns and audio podcasts. You can follow me on Twitter at Ashraf Engineer. That's A-S-H-R-A-F-E-N-G-I-N-W-E-R and All Indians Count. That's A L L. I-N-D-I-A-N-S-C-O-U-N-T. Search for the All Indians Matter page on Facebook. On Instagram, the handle is All Indians Matter. Email me at editor at allindiansmatter.in. Catch you again soon.
Listen, there's a reason the ultra wealthy have been investing in fine wine for centuries. Historically stable returns and a lack of volatility make it stand out compared to traditional assets, especially during a downturn. But now you can invest alongside with them with Vint. Vint is an SEC qualified investment platform that offers shares of the most sought after wines in the world. So join the thousands of investors diversifying with fine wine and spirits. Learn more at VINT.co. For full investment disclosure information and more, visit VINT.co. 